Hi, welcome to Zombie Space Waffles. I'm Erica, and I'm Erica. And the votes are in. All three of you voted for a dramatic reading of the short story that came in the Cryptocurium uh, September box, which was the first part of the trick and treat, I guess. Uh, trick was September, and treat is on its way. Uh, anyhow, we got a short story in here, and I'm going to do a dramatic reading of the story, The Flatsit Library, a tale by Ken James. It was 11.30 p.m. October 31st in Northeast Philadelphia. Four friends were walking through Parkwood, a small neighborhood, a short distance from the flat fields where once stood the Philadelphia State Hospital which came to be affectionately known as the Byberry Insane Asylum. All the locals knew the stories of what went on inside those walls while it was still in operation and the awful experiments and treatment of the patients by the doctors and staff. By the time the funding was pulled from the state and the doors were closed for good, all the patients had been discharged, some even just allowed to leave with nowhere to live. This added to the lore of the crazies that lived in the surrounding woods and even returned to the building which was all they knew of home. From the time it closed until the time those buildings were torn down, adventurous teens would sneak in, causing the state to keep security on site even to this day. Do you think they uh, up the security on Halloween? Tom asked his friends. No way, said Mike. If anything, the security and the cops are still worried about the mess that happened at the rehab last night. Upon Byberry's closing and most of the buildings being demolished, a few of the buildings were refurbished and used for offices and such, one of which was a rehab for alcoholics and drug addicts. This stood on the other side of Southampton Road with some residences' windows looking over the flats where the rest of Byberry used to stand. Last night, one of the patients living there had killed himself. Did you hear why he did it? Tom asked. Because he was a junkie and couldn't handle life, replied Donnie, the skeptic of the group. No dick, he was seeing a person at his window for weeks. He started drawing him in an exercise he learned in one of his classes to cope with withdrawal. He kept telling his staff that the man was asking for help. They all told him to take his methadone and relax. I guess they should have listened, Tom exclaimed. Kevin added. After he did it, they searched his room. He put all the drawings up all over the walls. Crazy thing is, in all the drawings of the man at the window, he was wearing a patient's gown. Fuck off, Donnie yelled. It's true, my cousin's girlfriend works there in the lobby. She saw the body drop, Tom replied. Mike looked at Tom and asked, the body drop? Yeah, the guy jumped out the window on the sixth floor, Tom replied. So this guy was seeing a man at his window, asking for help, dressed like a patient on the sixth floor? I guess the drawings aren't the most fucked up part, laughed Kevin. Donnie angrily said, Look, assholes, my grandfather was a doctor in charge of the patient care at that place. And my dad told me how he would come home from work every night upset because the treatments weren't working and how he would lose another one to one thing or another and it tore him apart. They were trying to help people and I'm just coming along with you dickheads to show you that there are no ghosts and we're not going to find shit. Mike turned and stopped all his friends. The mission at hand, guys. We're almost at the bullet if we're going to get over the fence and into the flats. I can't have you guys girling, Mike said sternly. As they approached Roosevelt Boulevard, the talking grew short and their nerves grew. Mike had ho hopped the fence by himself many times before, looking for an open entrance to the tunnel system that everyone called the catacombs. The catacombs were almost as legendary as Byberry itself. It was rumored that the catacombs lead to every building and even secret graveyards on the property. It was Mike's dream to find a way in because that's all that was left of Byberry. Now, Mike isn't the biggest believer in ghosts and the supernatural, but something in him told him to go back to the flats tonight. The gang ran across Roosevelt Boulevard and entered the woods to use as cover to hop the fence where Byberry once stood. They ran to the fence and all kneeled down to listen to Mike. Okay, guys. We're going over two at a time. Tom and Donnie, you go first. Me and Kevin will help you over. When you hit the ground on the other side, we're coming over and you help us down, Mike directed. The gang executed Mike's plan and began walking towards where Mike last ended his search. Okay, guys, we're going this way, Mike ordered. How the hell do you know, Donnie? questioned. Mike didn't answer, but they kept following because if there was anyone who knew their way around the flats, it was Mike. 
Mike's flashlight would scan the area ahead of them and then go down to his map that he made from all the times he explored the flats before. Come on, Mike, how do you know where we're going? asked Kevin. Looking forward, Mike replied, because this is the only way. I haven't gone yet. Don't fuck around, man. Are you serious? Donnie asked. Shit, 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 Tom continued. Kevin interrupted. Relax, guys. What's the worst that can happen? We get caught by security. You think some fat rent-a-cop can catch us? We'll be out. Donnie grabbed Mike by the shoulder and turned him around. If I get arrested, I'm blaming you for everything. I'll tell my parents I'm never hanging out with you again, Donnie yelled. Mike replied, chill. No one's getting arrested. Now can we please get our shit together and go find the catacombs? The gang shook it off and continued on their mission. It was now midnight and the thick fog began to settle on the flat. Their flashlight began to fall dead in the fog. Mike, what's the plan here? This isn't good, Tom said with a lump in his throat. We keep moving forward, Mike demanded. The fog grew impossibly thick as the gang's faith in Mike was disappearing. Kevin and Tom huddled close to Mike as they walked. Donnie hung behind, peering at Mike the whole way. Mike stopped and looked down at his map and made an X on the paper with a red marker. Tom grabbed Kevin and Mike. Do you hear that? He shivered. As they were standing surrounded by fog, voices began to cry out ahead of them. They were pleading for help, begging for it to stop. Crying and moans grew louder from what sounded like a hundred people. Men, women, and children. The gang stood still. Are you fucking kidding me? Kevin whispered. Tom looked back at Donnie. What would your grandpa say about that, Donnie? Can you hear them? How many are there? Tom yelled. The cries grew louder and louder. Donnie yelled back, Fuck you, this is all a big prank. Mike has been planning this for months. Coming out here by himself, and then all of a sudden he wants us to come to the flats on Halloween? Bullshit. So Mike came out here and set up a thousand fog machines? Do you hear that, Donnie? Kevin questioned. Mike stood in silence. Tom, well, Mike, tell him. Tell him you're doing this somehow. Come on, Indiana Jones, why are you so quiet now? Always the man with the plan. Fuck this, I'll show you guys that this asshole is setting us up. Donnie pushed past the gang, and Mike grabbed his arm. Donnie. Mike shuddered. Donnie ripped his arm from Mike's grip and walked into the fog toward the pleading voices. The gang stood silent as Donnie disappeared into the fog. The voices grew overwhelming as Tom closed his eyes and yelled, Donnie! Then all went quiet. The boys stood huddled together in the middle of the flats for what seemed like forever. Then they heard footsteps toward them. A figure started to take shape as it got closer. They began to make out the figure of a man. The man came closer until it broke the fog and was right on top of them. It was an emaciated man in a patient's gown. The boy stood frozen. The man looked at Mike. Thank you, said the man. The man then walked into the fog in the distance. Donnie was screaming. The boys took off running into the opposite direction until the fog began to break. They kept running until the fence was in sight. They reached the fence and all hopped over as fast as they could. When they hit the ground on the other side, they heard a voice. Stop right there. It was a police officer. The boys frantically told him what had happened. The officer called for the paddy wagon and all the boys were taken home. They tried to tell their parents what happened, but they wouldn't listen. A search party was sent out into the flats to look for their friend. It took the police three days to find Donnie, or what was left of him. The official police report said that Donnie had fallen into an uncovered entrance to an old tunnel system of the hospital and died from the fall. What they left out was that Donnie's body had looked like it had been there for 50 years and was found on a pile of skeletons wearing patients' aprons. <laughs> Alright, that's it. Thank you and good night.